Good morning, church family. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Let's stand up on our feet here this morning. And as we do, can we welcome our online family here this morning? Come on, we can do that, right? And ultimately, obviously, welcome Jesus in this place. God, we love you in this place. And no matter what we're going through, God, we just want to stand and say that we'll praise you anywhere here this morning. Let's put our hands together here today and lift up the name of Jesus. the giant we'll praise you anywhere God Lord we just thank you that you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and that you love us thank you for your sacrifice Jesus we were not worthy but you still saw value in us like you always do thank you for your sacrifice God
together here say so praise the father praise the son praise the spirit three in one god of glory let us be praise can we sing that one more time if you feel comfortable would you lift up your hands we're going to sing it again God, we praise you. We praise the Son. We praise the Spirit. Three in one. The God of glory. Majesty. We praise forever to the King of kings. Can we do that here this morning? Can we praise the King of kings in this place?
Ephesians chapter 2 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We've been saved by God's grace. We've been saved by the blood of Jesus. We say we plead the blood because, because before Jesus, if we had to plead, we had to plead guilty. But now our defense is the blood of Jesus. And we are made clean by the blood of Jesus. It's only in God's kingdom that blood could make something clean. It's only in God's clean kingdom that blood could make something white as snow. We can't understand it and we can't try, but we can trust that his blood washes us white as snow today. And we stand forgiven. We stand without shame with Christ interceding for us today. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins, who takes away the sins of the world so that we can walk blameless and shameless. Father, may we glorify you in the way we live our lives. May you be glorified today. May your name be lifted high today. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you can be seated. Thank you so much for being with us. It is a beautiful day that the Lord has made today, is it not? Amen. Amen. Well, we are excited about what is happening here at Woodlawn Church. And one of those things that's happening is happening next week, and that is Church on the Lawn. Who's excited for Church on the Lawn? Come on. It's going to be a great time. We're going to be worshiping out in our parking lot and have an inspiring message from Pastor Matt. Uh, there's going to be, uh, this is what I'm excited about. I'm excited about baptisms, water baptisms happening out at our outdoor service. It is incredible. We have, we have 36 people signed up to be baptized next week. That is just incredible. And then we'll have food trucks. That's my second favorite thing about next week is the food trucks, inflatables, uh, coffee truck, hallelujah, and a dunk tank. I'm not excited about the dunk tank because something tells me that I'm going to be in that dunk tank at some point in time. So, but maybe with all of our encouragement, we'll get Pastor Matt in the dunk tank as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll hear about that this week. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, but we are excited. We, we want you to uh, be able to make it out next week. And also, it takes a lot of people, a lot of hands to uh, make Church on the Lawn happen. And if you can help us out, we would really appreciate it. You can sign up by scanning the code on the screen behind me. And uh, there's, there's a lot of different jobs. We need help setting up on Saturday morning. We won't take a whole lot of your time. Uh, we'll have you out by about uh, between 11 and 12 and uh, in the morning and uh, 11 a.m., 12 p.m. is what I meant. So um, we'll have you out in just a few hours, but it, it, it really does help us out when uh, you guys show up. And then also on Sunday, we need some help. We need uh, help with parking cars so people can get in and out safely. We need help with tearing things down afterwards, both out front and in the back when our family fest is over. So there are a lot of things that you can do. So we would just ask you scan the code, take a look and see where you might plug into one of those. We're going to kick it over to our Woodlawn News team now. They're going to let you know what else we have going on. Hey guys, I'm Gabrielle. Welcome to Woodlawn Church, and thank you for spending part of your weekend with us. Whether you're here with us in person or joining us online, we are thrilled to have you here with us today. Our last outdoor service of the summer is next weekend, and we can't wait to see you there. After an amazing time of worship and a powerful message, we're bringing back all the activities to follow. 
We'll also be taking the time to pray over all the students and teachers as they get ready to start a new school year. They continue to face new pressures and challenges like never before, so we want to pray God's blessing and covering over them. Don't forget that we're also hosting more water baptisms that day too. So whether you're new to Christ, recently rededicated your life, or maybe just never made this declaration publicly, we would love to have you be a part. Have you found your community yet? In times like these, we need the strength of our fellow believers to walk through the fires together in faith, prayer, and community. And that is exactly why we're starting up our community groups again soon. There will be a number of different groups to choose from, so there's something for everyone. If you need help finding a group, you can scan the QR code or visit www.woodlawnonline.com slash community groups. We can't wait to share a community group with you. If you like what you see here at Woodlawn, then Growth Track is your next step. Our next class is starting soon, and it's just your opportunity to learn more about the church and see where you can get involved. You can sign up online or in person at their church welcome center. That's all we have for right now. If you would like more information, feel free to check out the link below. In the meantime, thanks again for joining us. We're so glad you're here. Well, good, 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 there I am. Good morning, everybody. How y'all doing? Y'all having a good morning? Enjoying this great weather? Good stuff, isn't it? Yes. Um, I am loving it, and I hope y'all are having a good Sunday so far as we are uh, motoring along here today. Uh, really excited, as um, Pastor Andrew said a moment ago about our outdoor service next weekend. It's going to be a great time. If you've never been to one, uh, you need to check it out. They are a lot of fun, and like uh, Pastor Andrew said a moment ago, I was amazed. I came in last Tuesday, and they gave me the report that already 36 people have signed up for baptism. That is incredible, and we're just praising God about that, and uh, it's not too late if you want to be baptized. You can um, just hit the QR code there, or if there's a QR. We keep all the QR codes in your newsletter as well. That way it's a little bit easier to access, or you can always stop out at the Welcome Center if uh, you're struggling to make that happen. But um, we're in the midst of a, a series right now that uh, I am thoroughly enjoying. I hope you're enjoying it. I Just studying it has been awesome. I was telling the 8 a.m. service, you know, it just, it's amazing. Uh, you can study God's Word all of your life, and then you can dive into a scripture, and it's like you read it for the first time. You know, the Word of God is like a prism. Every time you look, it's it's just, it's God's word. It's living. It's alive. It's just, it's amazing. And so uh, we've been really digging deep into this series. We like to dig deep, uh, especially in the summertime. And so if you don't mind, uh, we'll go ahead and stand up for the reading of God's word. As we do, could we welcome everybody watching online today? So good to have all of you today. Um, we have an ever-growing and expanding uh, audience that have been watching online. I'd also like to let those of you that are watching online know uh, that we are taking communion. We like to take communion on the first uh, Sunday of every month. And if you want to take communion with us at the end of the service, all you got to do is get a cracker and a little bit of juice or something, and you can take communion right there with us in your home. Uh, today, I'm not going to recap because we've covered a lot of ground uh, over the course of the last uh, five weeks, this being week number six of our series. And uh, today, what I want to talk to you about is I want to talk about this helmet, the Bible says we're to put on the full armor of God. That means we need to know what all the pieces are and how they affect us spiritually and how they affect our lives. Uh, and today, we're going to be talking about this helmet of salvation. For some people, they don't really understand what that means, but I want to tell you what. How many of you know our head is one of the most important parts of our body, and you've got to protect that head? And the Bible said it's God's salvation that protects us. We're going to go ahead and look at a few verses here today. Uh, you'll see them up on the screen, verses 13, actually through 17. That's a little typo on my part, but 17 is on there. Um, the Bible says this, Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist on the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. So again, the full armor of God. So what? We can stand. Then it goes on to say in verse 14, Stand firm, therefore, having belted your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, 
righteousness and having strapped on your feet the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, we talked about that last week, uh, by which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now here we are in verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Lord, we pray this morning as we dive into your word that, Lord, your word would strengthen us, equip us, challenge us, and help us to become more like you today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. And you can be seated. So uh, helmets, they are a part of life. Uh, We all know that, right? From maybe being a child, um, we have, uh, they didn't have these really when I was growing up. If you grew up like me in the 70s and 80s, um, like I did, uh, we didn't have these uh, bike helmets. Aren't they a great invention though? Strapping those bad boys on your kids, maybe on yourself, so if they wipe out, they will uh, not hurt themselves. When I was a kid, uh, those things didn't exist. You know, we just, you know, I rode these crazy looking bikes, uh, dating myself. Y'all remember those bikes that had those funky handlebars and those banana seats? Remember those? I had some nasty wipeouts on those. Probably could have used a helmet. Might be some of my problem today. I'm just joking. Uh, but helmets, they, they protect. Motorcycle helmets, you know I'm an avid motorcycle rider, and I am, a, I am an avid believer that we should wear helmets because your head is one of the most important things about you. Uh, for those of you that work construction, I worked construction for a few years when I was a young man, and you wear a hard hat on certain job sites to protect you from anything that might fall and hurt you. And Then, of course, there's sports, sports of all kinds. When you play baseball, there are batting helmets. Even people that ride horses, the equestrian folks, uh, they have those fancy little helmets, but they're not there just to decorate. They're there to protect your head in case you fly off on your head. Uh, But then into sports, of course, there is my favorite sport this time of year, Hall of Fame week. It is football. Any football fans out there today? Come on now. Uh, the Browns, they, they, they pulled it off. They weren't looking too good at first, but the Browns made a way. Don't disappoint me this year. Um, anyway, any Brown fans out there? All right. So football helmets, technology has come a long way on those. When I played football when I was a kid, we used to have those Rydell helmets that had those, y'all remember those of you guys that played? They had those little square blocks all over the place. They were like, they, they might as well have been like as hard as plastic and you'd take your helmet off and you'd be all sweaty and you'd have these like indentions on your head all over. I don't think, I think those things might have done more harm than good back in the day. But uh, I was really blessed when I got a bike helmet where you could pump air into the helmet I thought I had finally arrived when I got a bike helmet. But uh, I say all that to say my son is a, a big, he's really into football, and this year he's transitioning. They do it in the league he's in, they have a transition year, so he goes from playing flag, he's played the last three years, and this year he's going to play what they call padded flag, so he has a helmet and shoulder pads, but they still pull flags. There's a little more hitting, and uh, the coach in our community decided that would be a good thing because they were finding that kids going from playing flag football to all of a sudden putting pads on and getting run over by people. It was just too much. So they gave him the buffer year, which I think is a cool idea. But I want to tell you what, already my son was complaining. He put the helmet on. He's like, Dad, it's so heavy. And I'm throwing balls and they're bouncing off his head and, and all of that. But uh, anyways, he's got his combine today. After, right after church, I got to race him over. He's got to do his, can you believe they do combines in his age group? Anyways, but fun stuff. But what we know is I'm glad he's wearing that helmet because helmets protect our head. We all know the power of, of brain injuries and head injuries, the traumatic uh, impact they can have on our lives. In fact, during COVID, many of you know the story where my, my son again was back playing with Zach and Emily's kids and they were jumping on this blow up thing and he flew off like a boy does and landed right on his head on the concrete. Scariest day of our parenting lives as they took him from, we went from stat care to Mercy Hospital, and then he was life-flighted to Akron Children's Hospital. And uh, I want to tell you what, it was one of the scariest times of our life. And immediately at both hospitals, what they did is they started doing scans to find out if he had a brain bleed, because that could be really, really dangerous. And I tell you, that's when you need a church family, you know? I mean, we had our church family praying for us, sending us text messages. And uh, man, when he woke up at midnight and looked at me and said, well, looked at my wife and (laughs) said, hi, mom. And it was the best, best moment of my life parenting so far. But head injuries, they're, they're, they're dangerous. And so it's interesting. As you look at this section of Scripture, the Apostle Paul wrote it. The Holy Spirit inspired him to write this. Here he is in jail, and he's being guarded 
uh, by a Roman soldier, and he's looking at all the uniform, all this armor that this soldier is wearing, and the Holy Spirit inspires him to actually write uh, uh, scripturally how you and I, using those pieces of armor, how you and I not equip ourselves physically, but how you and I equip ourselves spiritually for the battles that we face because we are in a battle. So as we look at this whole idea of a helmet, what the helmet provided for a Roman soldier was two things. It provided their identity and it provided safety. <clears throat> so when a Roman soldier put this incredibly lo awesome looking helmet on, uh, when he put it on, it was a source of identity. I mean, he was strapping that helmet on and he was like, man, I am a part of the Roman army. We are the biggest, fastest, strongest, baddest dudes on the planet. And uh, they were proud to put that helmet on, all right? And uh, also it provided, of course, safety because they're getting swords and battle axes and arrows and they need to protect that head. So um, I decided today that I would bring illus another illustration to you. You guys all been enjoying my illustrations so far, right? Y'all excited what I've been bringing to you? So this series, I figured every week I'll try to bring you something. And uh, I'm thinking, what could we use that would be a beautiful representation of the helmet of salvation? And then it hit me. Y'all ready? Here it is, baby. Right there. Isn't that a beautiful piece of equipment? Come on now. Don't leave. <laughs> Ken Ferguson said, stone him. <laughs> um, I just brought this to make you upset. I just have fun with you today. Actually, so I, I had a gentleman that comes to the 11 o'clock service. He's from Michigan. He went to the University of Michigan. So he suggested, he said, hey, Pastor Matt, when you do the helmet of salvation, he says, I have a, an authentic Michigan football helmet. He said, I'll bring it for you. And so he dropped it off this week, and I set it up in my office, and the staff's all coming and going, what? what's up? And I said, come on, Dan. I said, compare a Buckeye helmet with a Michigan helmet. Which one really looks better? Okay. So before anybody gets mad, I do this just to make you upset. Just have fun with you, actually. The Buckeyes will probably win this year. But anyways, so everybody good? You still here? Put your rocks down. Because I have a genuine Roman helmet, baby. And you're probably wondering, where in the world did he get that? Where do you think I got it from? Amazon, Amazon Prime, baby. <laughs> Two days. In fact, my, it was funny. Last Monday it came and we were out working in the yard and my daughter's like carrying this box because it's about her birthday. So she's been getting gifts in the mail. And so she thought it was hers and she kept dropping it and she'd pick it up and she'd drop it. And finally on the back porch, we open it up and I thought it was something for her. And then I looked in, I'm like, I saw this red thing. I'm like, it's my helmet. I was so stoked about it. But um, these helmets were pretty awesome, weren't they? I mean, if you look at them, they were made of iron and bronze and obviously they were there to protect the, the, the head of the warrior, the soldier, because you imagine they have arrows flying at them, they have swords at them coming at them, they have battle axes in some situations coming at them. Uh, and actually, uh, this was actually redesigned about 10 years before uh, the Apostle Paul wrote this epistle, this letter, this Roman helmet was redesigned and what they did was is they added uh, this back part to cover the neck, especially because when they were in battles during that time, some of their enemies had something called a broadsword. And a broadsword was like four foot long, and it was this big, heavy sword. And I want to tell you what, man, if you took one of those to the back of the neck, it's over, bub. And uh, so they needed ultimate protection. And then they added these flaps that come down along the side, and uh, that was to protect the side of the face and the cheeks. And it just looked pretty intimidating, didn't it? I mean, if you look at that thing, that is pretty awesome. And so if, imagine this. Here's Paul. He's in jail. He's being guarded by some dude wearing one of these. And he's looking at that, and the Holy Spirit's like, helmet of your salvation. Like, how do you make a connection between this and our salvation? Well, in the next 18 minutes, I'm going to try, okay? Here we go. Y'all ready? I'm going to give you three things about this helmet. It's really important to you and I. And number one is this, that the helmet of salvation provides you and I 
with identity. Again, um, this, what this did for the Roman soldier is when he put this thing on. I mean, check this thing right here. I mean, what's up with that? If you're a little short on hair, that's a good thing, you know? You can sweep your floor with it. Um, but if you look at that, this, this was meant to make a statement. Yes, it was meant to protect, but when they put this on, uh, maybe y'all, when, remember, guys, go with me to your high school football days or maybe college if you were real good. And, um, remember the pride that you felt when you put that helmet on? Like you were suiting up for battle. You were like, yeah. And, and when you put that helmet on, you were proud of your team. You were proud to belong to that team. Well, that's what a Roman soldier felt when he put this on. He felt proud to be a Roman soldier. He was on the winning team. His team had won the national championship year after year after year. Uh, they, they literally were the baddest dudes on the planet. And so to be part of that team, you had a real sense of pride, a real sense of belonging, a real sense that you were protected because there were other people other dudes watching out for you. Uh, remember last week when I showed you with the, with the, uh, the, the shields and they had that tortoise formation where they would all cover each other? I mean, it was a pretty awesome operation to watch these guys go to war. So there was this idea of identity. So they made these really opulent. They made them really, uh, really stately because they wanted to intimidate their foes. So if you were an enemy of Rome and you saw this, a bunch of dudes coming your way with those helmets on, you were immediately intimidated. And so it had an intimidating presence. It had a, a presence of pride that these guys would have. And it's interesting that they would take that, Paul would, or the Holy Spirit ultimately, and talk about your salvation and mine, like strapping one of these things on our heads. In fact, but look what the Bible says, you and I, the privilege we get. Paul says this a couple chapters earlier in Ephesians 2. It says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, outsiders, without rights of citizenship, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, God's people, and members of God's own household. So here's the beautiful thing. I don't know what kind of family you came from. Maybe you came from a, a wonderful, perfect, or close to perfect godly family. If that is you, awesome. If you came from a broken, jacked up family, or you didn't have a family at all, or any family you had was just dysfunctional, I got good news for you. Because when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, when you give your life to the Lord, when you get saved, in that moment, God crowns you with one of these babies, all right? And uh, what it is, is it's a sense of belonging, that you no longer are tossed to and fro, but you are a member of God's household. You are a son or a daughter of God, and he loves you, and you belong to him. And so the idea here is that when you put that thing on, I have a sense of importance because I belong to the creator of the universe. He knows me. He loved me. He sent his son for me. And by putting uh, my faith in what Jesus did, I am now engrafted into God's family. I'm a member of his household. So imagine that. We're sons and daughters of the creator of the universe. We play on his team. In fact, the Bible even says, Paul uses the whole analogy of the army. It's no wonder he's talking about armor to us. When he was writing in the book of Timothy, he said that, you know, we're like soldiers in God's army. We shouldn't get in love with the world because we need to be devoted to serving God. So the idea here is that, yes, we're being drafted into God's army. We are God's children. We are God's people. He's the creator of the universe. He's ultimately going to win out and everything. And we are blessed to be on his team. And the reason why I want to, it's funny, when I was putting this message together, I kind of thought I was going to spend most of the time on the mind, which we're going to get to, but I really felt like the Holy Spirit, like, touching my heart to spend a little more time on this first point, identity. And why? Because in our world today, the greatest questions are questions of identity, are they not? I mean, that's what we're seeing across the, the globe today. Statistics prove that one of the number one things people are asking is this. Maybe you've asked these questions. Who am I? Who really am I? Why am I here? Is there a purpose in all of this? 
Am I here just to take up air, space, and water and die? Like, why am I here? What makes me special? What makes me set apart? Do I really have any purpose? You ever been there before? Let's take it a little bit deeper. People ask those questions. And then there's the questions of, of even like my sexuality. People question their sexuality. People question their gender. I, somebody will say, I feel trapped in a body that wasn't that I don't feel like I belong in. And so when you look across the world today, people are asking these questions. What, why, how? And here's the root of the problem of what many people are facing. They're starting with the wrong end in mind. What I mean is they're starting with themselves. Who am I? What Who do I belong to? What makes me special? And either it's they're asking that themselves or they're letting somebody else speak into their life, a social media influencer, their favorite whatever music artist, uh, whoever it might be, uh, their, their, their professors, teachers tell them who they should be or who they ought to be. And really what it's doing is precipitating more and more confusion. Because every question, listen, every question that you and I ever need answered doesn't begin with me, doesn't begin with culture, doesn't begin with politics. It begins with God. Do y'all believe that today? I find my answers in him. And that is where we start. We start in knowing him. So what, what does the Bible say? Let me give you some encouraging scriptures. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We know some of these. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation, old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are born again, you are made new, and in that moment you take on the identity that God created you for. It's awesome. Look at what the Bible says here in Ephesians 2. Uh, Pastor Andrew read this earlier today. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. How many of y'all appreciate God's grace in your life? How many of y'all know salvation doesn't come because I'm good or because you're good? Salvation doesn't come because we do a lot of religious things to earn it. Salvation comes by you and I putting our faith in what God did through his grace. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Notice this, not of works lest anyone should boast. Check out verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So check this out. So God loved us so much, Jesus died for us, defeated death, rose from the grave for your salvation and mine. When I put my faith in Jesus and what he did for me, in that moment, I am made brand new. I am born again on the inside. I am made new. God's Holy Spirit comes in me, all right? But look what verse 10 says. You and I are God's workmanship. You know what that word actually means in the original language? It means poem. You and I are God's poem. So when a poet writes a poem, they take a whole lot of time and emotional and mental energy to make sure every word is perfect. Every word is right what it needs to be. And every phrase, every line relates to the next line and it flows. Listen to me. The amount of time that a poet will put into a very short poem is mind-boggling. Well, the Bible says you and I are God's poem. What does that mean? That means that God handcrafted you. Can I tell you something? Some of you are struggling with your identity. Some of you are struggling with who you are. Some of you are struggling with your gifts and strengths and deficiencies that we all have. Can I tell you something today? God made you just the way you are for a purpose. When he created you, he didn't make you as a mistake. You are a hand crafted miracle of God. And listen, when he created you, he not only created you to know him and to love him and to walk with him and to have his blessing, but he created you for a purpose. Do you realize that today? You and I are created for a purpose. That's awesome to stop and think about that. I have a purpose. You have a purpose. And so here's the deal that you and I We can live confidently and boldly knowing whose we are. 
Not necessarily always who I am, but yes, knowing who I am, but ultimately knowing whose I am. Knowing who I am comes from knowing whose I am. And when I come to know Christ, I can live my life with confidence. I can live my life with boldness. One of my favorite scriptures in the New Testament is John 3, 1. It says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So the Bible says, see what great love. Some versions say behold. That word behold means to look, look again, and keep on looking. Look at the amazing love God has for you. The Father, you have a Father in heaven. I have a Father in heaven. You may not even know your dad. Or the dad that you know, you don't want to know. But you have a Father in heaven who loves you. And you and I, through our faith in Jesus, are sons and daughters of God. We are on his team. He loves us. And we have a purpose. And yes, the world's not going to always love us. The world's not going to always celebrate who we are and what we're called to do. Jesus said they wouldn't. Why? Because they didn't know him. And if they don't know him, they're not going to understand you. And it's okay for you and I to live that way and know that, that in this life not everybody's going to celebrate our faith. But you and I can still live. I don't have to live with a bunch of insecurity and fear and feeling bad all the time. But when I put on the helmet of salvation... I can say, man, I belong to God. I have a purpose. God made me. There is something special about me. And you can live that way. In fact, Sheila Meese, she stopped by on Friday. Many of you know Sheila Meese. She is a precious part of our church. She was here 10 years ago when we got here, and she has been one of the most incredible supporters of our church. And uh, she just had a kidney transplant. Um, She was in like stage four, almost stage five kidney failure. Praise God, she needed a kidney. Here's how good our father is. She went to Cleveland, our university hospitals, one of those great hospitals up there. And um, they took her through everything and they said it'll be three to five years to get you a kidney most likely. In less than three months, a donor came and she got a kidney. And she got her kidney. But isn't that awesome? And she looked great. She said, man, she said, I didn't realize how bad I felt until I got a new kidney. She looks great. She sounds great. She feels great. She can't come to church every week right now because they still, her transplant doctors don't want her being around crowds of people at this point, but she stopped in to see us. And when she stopped in, uh, Chris McAnally was, had this, this, they cover these things with oil when they pack them to you and send them to you so they don't rust. And so Chris had it in the kitchen and he was cleaning it all up when she walked by and she said, oh, the helmet of salvation this week. So she came in to talk to us and she said, pastor, she said, I love the series. I'm watching every week online. And she said, um, I've been, I, I'm reading a devotional. She said that ironically is going right along with your series. And she said, I just read this part about the helmet of salvation and how awesome it was and how you and I should live because of it. So I was going to ask her, Sheila, would you give me that? Give me a copy of that. I didn't see her anymore Friday. I came in this morning, and she had written it down and put it by my door. And so this is what her devotional said about this helmet of salvation. The Roman soldier's helmet was a fascinating and flamboyant piece of armor, very ornate and intricate. Your salvation is the most gorgeous and most intricate, most elaborate, most ornate gift God has ever given you. By using the example of Roman helmets, Paul is telling us something very important. When a person is confident of his salvation and when he walks confidently in the powerful reality of all that God's salvation means for him, he is a noticeable individual. (laughs) I thought that was so good. And that's how God wants you and I to live. I am a son or daughter of God. I belong to God. I have a purpose. I am important. And you can live with your head up. Here's number, number two. And that is the helmet of salvation. It also protects our minds. And that's what's really critical. As we looked at this helmet, the biggest thing this did was to protect the soldier from a head wound. Uh, because a head wound could, could be fatal. Uh, even one that wasn't even very hard could be fatal. So it, it offered an amount of protection. And it's interesting how the Holy Spirit has Paul talk about 
this helmet to cover the mind. You want to know why? Let me be, be real practical with you today. The mind is something the enemy of our souls is after. He, if he's after one thing in your life and mine, he is after our minds. You want to know why? Because whatever controls your mind, don't miss this, whatever controls your mind will control your life. That is why we are un, under such immense uh, worldly influence and things that are happening in the world today because the enemy knows if he can pollute your mind, he can pollute your life. If he can defeat your mind, he can defeat your life. And so we're constantly under war for our minds. As the mind goes, the man follows. And we all know what the Bible says in Proverbs 23. It says, for as he thinks in his heart, what? So is he. So the Bible even backs this up and says, as I think in my heart, so am I. So again, whatever controls your thought life will control your life. In fact, years ago, I, I never forgot something I read in one of John Maxwell's leadership books. His dad was a great leader as well, and his dad was traveling in Asia. And when he was in Asia, he happened to go by a, a, a tattoo studio, and tats are pretty big nowadays. I have nothing against tats if you're all tatted up, but that's awesome. I don't have any, but should I get one? Uh, anyways, should I tat up? Okay. <laughs> I'm probably too old for that. But anyways, uh, but I say that to say he walked by and he was seeing all the examples they had up in the window for tattoos. And one of them said, one tattoo, it was right in the front, said born to lose. And he couldn't believe it, that somebody would tattoo that on their body. So he goes in and talks to this little oriental man that's running the store and he says, do people really get that thing tattooed on their body? He says, yeah, all the time. And he says, I don't understand. And this little Asian man looked back at him and said, before tattoo on body, tattoo on mind. It's true. What we see come out in our life is a product of what we're musing on and thinking on and allowing to control our thoughts. If I think I'm going to lose, I'm probably going to to lose. If I think I'm a loser, I'll probably act that way. If I feel uh, like I'm depressed, I will probably think depressive thoughts. I will probably be depressed. I mean, you think lustful thoughts, you're going to end up desiring whatever you think you will desire and ultimately you will act out on. It's a principle of life. So you and I have to vigilantly take charge of our thought life. I wish I had two hours to speak to you today and I don't. Because all these scriptures could be standalone sermons in themselves. But you might want to go back and look at these this week. Look what the Bible teaches us about our thought life in 2 Corinthians 10. It says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Famous scripture. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Stop right there. What's a stronghold? A stronghold is a pattern of thinking that somebody cannot break out of. It's like being in prison to your thoughts, being a prisoner of these toxic negative thoughts in your life. Maybe today you're here or maybe you're watching online and you feel that way. As much as you try to break these patterns of negative, depressing, anxious, fearful, lustful, whatever they are, thoughts, it just seems like you can't break out of this prison because it is a stronghold in your life. In fact, uh, years ago, there was a man visiting, a reporter visiting a circus. And if you've ever been to a circus and ever seen a giant circus elephant tied up to a little pity, bitty stake in the ground, this couple thousand pound animal is tied up with a little rope on a little stake dove in the ground and he doesn't even try to pull it out. One gentleman, this gentleman went and asked the circus trainer, like, how do you do that? And he said, it's easy. He said, when they're little, when they're little elephants, we tie them off to a tree. And they'll sit there for days yanking on that thing until something in their brain clicks and tells them they can't ever get free. And that's why we can take a 2,000-pound elephant with a tiny little rope and a stake in the ground, and he won't even try to get free even though he can get free because he doesn't believe in his mind that he can be free. Isn't that incredible? That's a stronghold. And sometimes we get that way. But on the contrary, we have power to, divine, to demolish these strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. 
Look at this. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. So he's saying God has empowered you and I with the word of God and these spiritual weapons that when thoughts come into my mind, I don't have to give them a home there. They don't have to rule my life anymore. I don't have to live this way anymore. A man wisely said, I can't stop the birds from flying over my head, but I can stop them from nesting in my hair. And isn't that true? I can't stop the birds from flying over, but I can keep them from nesting in my hair. In our backyard, we have these hawks that come. You ever seen them hawks? They swoop down and they pick up squirrels. And I know God made them, but I don't like them. I got a thing. I sent Harley after one one day, my dog. I'm like, go get a boy. I'm sorry. I love animals. Don't get me wrong. But I can't. I can't stop them from flying over my yard, but I can stop them from making a nest in my yard. And it's the same thing with our thoughts. You and I don't have to live that way. So you take it captive. How many of y'all parents of young children? How many of you love it? How many of you love it most of the time? How many of y'all remember when you had young children? Remember shopping with young children? So, all right. So we live close to this drug mart store, and that place is like from heaven, man, I'm telling you. It's like a mini Walmart. They have almost, I can't believe, if I need it, they have hardware in there. I can't even believe it. So we go there occasionally, and uh, we were in there one night, and uh, my kids were just being kids. I have good kids. I thank God for my good kids, but they're not good all the time. And we're in there, and they're just, I don't know if we gave them sugar before we got there or what, but they're just getting loud. Then they're getting louder. Then they're running down. They're picking stuff off the shelf. Something falls over. I'm like, hey, put it back. And, and next thing you know, they're louder. Next thing you know, they're four, you know, four aisles over making a scene. I got into dad mode at that moment. <laughs> like, <clears throat> I'm a sheriff and I'm hunting for somebody. Two little kids. And I found those and I said, You know how you don't have to be loud as a parent. You just, they see the intensity on your <laughs> And they came over and they were fearful. Godly reverence, fatherly reverence. And I looked at them and I said, we are in a store and we are coochers and we don't act like idiots. <laughs> Listen, you got to do that with your thought life. When that thought comes into your mind, I'm a failure, the ship's going down, it's all over. Listen, you got to say, uh-uh, God is with me, God is for me, God's going to work this out. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I trust my God. You got to strap that helmet on and say, not today. Amen? So we have to constantly, I can't just focus on the negative stuff that's trying to get in, take, take real estate in my mind. What I want to do is proactively focus on what God is saying. Isn't that true? I have to focus on what God is saying. Let's go back to the football analogy. Just making sure you're all awake. It's any team. I don't know what team it might be today. But the quarterback, how do you know when the quarterback is running the offense, he is probably the most important guy at that moment on the offensive team. Because he's the one reading the defense, calling audibles, calling the plays, executing whatever they're going to do, whether that's handoff, play action, whatever they do. Um, he's the guy calling the shots. And what he's always doing is he's under constant attack, right? Those linebackers and defensive ends and guards, they want to, they kind of want to kill the guy. I mean, it's kind of, <laughs> it's just the way they do it. Um, so they don't want to just tackle him, they want to tackle him hard. And uh, so he is usually not the biggest guy on the field. And there's 300 pound dudes that run like four, five forties and they want to come and smash you. So in that moment, he's under constant attack. And now he's doing his best to read the defense, look at the play, try to call the shot with all these dudes coming to crush him. However, he has help, especially if you're in college or the pros. Because if you're a college or a pro player, you have a guy sitting in a booth up top in a press box, and he's your offensive coordinator, and he's high above, 
And he's looking down. And he's looking at what the defense is doing. The stuff you can't see. He's seeing it. And chances are he knows strategy a little bit better than you do. And he's already watched the films on the other team. And he knows what they do. And he knows what they're trying to plan. And so what happens is now they put a microphone or a speaker in the helmet of the of the quarterback, and that guy can speak directly from the press box into his helmet and say, I know you want to do this, and I know it looks like this, but you got to do this. And so in that moment, he has a decision whether he's going to make his own decision or if he's going to trust the word of his offensive coordinator. That is like God. He is constantly speaking to you and I through his word. He's constantly speaking to you and I through the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And we have to tune our minds into what he is saying. Because the enemy's speaking all the time. He's intimidating you all the time. There's challenges all the time. But look what the Bible says. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't let your mind be conformed to what the world's trying to make you think. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So I can't let my mind just be crushed by everything going on around me. My mind has to be renewed. Every time you open your Bible, you're renewing your mind. You know, I made a discipline in my own life. When I wake up in the morning, before I look at any news or my email or anything else on my phone, the very first thing I do before I take a sip of coffee, I open my Bible app and I look at the scripture of the day. And the first words I read, the first things I hear are from God. Every day I want the word. Because what's happening is you're renewing your mind. You're refocusing your mind. When, when you're in church today, when you're tuned in online, right now your mind is being renewed. You are thinking God's thoughts. And your life is, will be the fruit of it. When you bring your kids to church, folks, listen. Man, I, I, we are so invested in our kids' ministry, student ministry, young adult ministry here. We think your kids need to be here. Your kids need to hear the word of God. You, we need to be teaching them at home. A couple weeks ago, I talked to you about Deuteronomy that said, you know, talk about the word in the morning with your kids. When you're walking by the way in the afternoon, talk about the word with your kids. Before you go to bed at night, why? I'll tell you why. Because the world is doing all it can do. The devil is doing all he can do to pollute the minds of our children. And it's our job to help their little minds get transformed. Amen? They're not old enough to always do it themselves. So we need to watch. What are they watching? What are they listening to? How do I, not legalistic, but how do I grow them in an environment where they love the word of God? And I want to tell you what. I had something so awesome happen on Friday. I had a coffee meeting with, with, with a friend of mine. And we got to talking, and time got slipping away, and Friday's usually a big study day for me, and I, I, I walk into the, the doors over by the offices, by the, kids, by the kids' gym over there, and when I opened the door, I heard worship music, and I, I'm like, worship music? And I look, and this is what I saw. I, I, I got my phone out. I, I couldn't believe it, so I had to check That was my daughter. She's like, Daddy, my kids were having their own worship service. Eyes closed, worshiping Jesus. Man, I want to tell you what, that right there is life changing. And that's what we want for our kids. That's the programming of, of their minds to think God's thoughts, to, to look to God, to be on God's team. So, uh, and then we can know God's will. So the idea is that when we get born again, we get made new on the inside. Remember this graphic I put up a few weeks ago? I don't have time to describe it much, but God made us in his image. He is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We are body, soul, and spirit. And what happens, we have this body that someday the Bible says we're going to get a new body in heaven someday. Hair and abs, remember that? Um, we have a soul, our mind, our will, and emotions, and we have a spirit. When you make Jesus the Lord of your life, you are born again. In that moment, Jesus comes in, you are born again, you are righteous in the sight of God, you are never more saved than you are in that moment. But your mind's not saved yet, 
and your body still wants to do what it used to do. That's why you can be saved and still have an anger issue. You can be saved and still have an addiction. You can be saved and still be challenged with lust and pornography. You can have that in your life because what needs to happen now is even though your spirit's been made new, now it has to make its way into your mind. That's how we work out our salvation. We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace immediately. That moment, just like the thief on the cross, boom, it's done. But then we have to work it out so the rest of us aligns. And we do that by renewing our mind, focusing our mind, knowing who we are. Lastly, almost lastly, let me just say to somebody today, you can have victory in your mind. I don't know who I'm talking to today. You can have victory over depression, anger, addiction, whatever it is. You can have victory in your mind. And I want you to know that today. And here's the last thing, is that the helmet of salvation provides us with hope. There's a, there's a companion scripture in the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, I believe it's 5.8. It says, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So this helmet I put on gives me my identity as a son and daughter of God. This helmet I put on protects my mind from what the enemy would like to do to ruin my life. It protects my mind. But this helmet of salvation, it also gives me hope. What is biblical hope? It's the confident expectation of good, of good. So hope is good things are coming. Here's what I know, folks. When you have this helmet of salvation strapped on, you can trust God to work out and to bring salvation into whatever circumstance you're dealing with, to deliver you, to help you, to provide for you, to heal you, to whatever it is you need God to do. Because God loves us so much, because of this incredible helmet of salvation, we have hope for God to turn things around in our life today. But ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, We have hope of eternity because we're not going to be here forever. Even if you're young today, you're going to get older. But the beauty is, even as my body gets older, I have hope that this is not the end. But because of Jesus, my Savior, this helmet I have on, I have identity, I have a defense, and I have a hope that God can turn things around in this life. And if he doesn't in this life, well, praise God, it's going to happen there. Amen? I have hope. You and I are never hopeless when we serve Jesus. Amen? So here's what Sheila said. So she was talking to us, and she said, I can't believe how I feel with this kidney. And then she paused, and she said, you know what, Pastor? I've been thinking. She said, this person, this person had died, but they had become an organ donor. And she said, this person died, and in their death, they gave me a gift. They gave me a kidney. And she said, they have bought me time. They have given me life here. I feel better. I'm going to live longer because of the sacrifice of this person. And then she started crying. And she said, but it made me think of Jesus because what Jesus did for us is he gave it all and he died so we can have life, not only in this life, but life for eternity. She said, pastor, he's given us life for eternity. Isn't that that great? Amen. God gave us life for eternity. So put your helmet on. It's your identity. It's your defense and it's your hope. Nothing is ever hopeless. We're going to take communion today. We like to do that on the first weekend of the month. Wherever you are, we invite you to take communion. If you're at home, you can take communion with us. Uh, How we do it is we have these prepackaged communions up here. If you're on this side over here or that side all the way to the back, uh, the ushers will release you from the back to the front. Just come down to the table nearest you. Grab one of these. And if you wouldn't mind today, remain standing because we're going to worship for a couple minutes. And then I'll lead us in communion and then we'll head out of here. If you're in the center section, stay right where you are. The ushers will pass the elements up and down the aisles. If you're in the balcony, same way. They'll pass it up and down the aisles. But as we take the communion today, it's a time, like you're the man, it's a time to remember what it cost Jesus 
It costs Jesus this for us to have this. We never want to forget the price that God paid. Amen? So as you get your communion, go back to your seat, stand up, worship with us. Uh, You can prepare it. If you pull the cellophane off the top of the tab, it releases the bread. If you pull the tab, it releases the juice. You want to get it ready. As soon as everybody's served, I'll come right back up. We'll wrap it up, and then we'll, we'll get you out of here. But let's take a few moments and worship. I love that song. It's a new worship song that came out by Brandon Lake about a month or two ago called I Plead the Blood. It's a powerful song, a little, little touch off that old uh, what can wash away nothing but the blood. But I hope you enjoy this and take a moment and worship God. I don't know about you, but I am so thankful. We call it the gospel, the good news. I am so thankful for the good news that God loved us so much that he sent his own son to die for us. And I don't think sometimes we realize what that cost him. You know, time of communion, it's a time to remember. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. When you come together, do this. I don't want you to forget what I did for you. Don't want you to forget this incredible salvation that I purchased for you. You know, Hebrews 2 says, the dangers of neglecting such a great salvation. I don't want to neglect this great salvation and what it cost my Lord. And if you're here today, maybe you're watching online, you don't have that hope of salvation. 
you don't really have that helmet strapped on your head spiritually. Maybe you're one of the folks that's really struggling in your life today. I want to invite you today to make Jesus the Lord of your life so you can spiritually have this on. And so how we like to do it around here is I just ask everybody to pray whether you need to or, or not. That way so people can feel comfortable to join in with us. But if you're here, you're online today and you need Christ in your life, could we all, before we take communion, pray this really important prayer? Could we just say, Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you died for my sins. I put my faith in you today as my personal Lord and Savior. Please forgive me of all of my sins and help me to live for you. In Jesus' name. You can hold that bread up. Symbolizes Jesus' body hung on a cross, the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice, the one and only sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice for us. You can eat that bread. As you hold that cup up, that symbolizes the blood of Jesus, washes away our sins. It's not good works. It's not being good. It's trusting in his sacrifice. We thank you for your forgiveness and your cleansing from guilt and shame. In Jesus' name, you can drink that. that prayer to make Jesus the Lord of your life. We have one request that you would uh, scan the code that's on the screen behind me or text the word accepted to 330-970-2899. And that will direct you to some very important next steps in your walk with Christ. Uh, we want to invite you back next week to Church on the Lawn, our outdoor service. It's the last one of the year. We are excited about it. We can't wait to be with you next week. We're going to move into our time of tithes and offerings and want to tell you if it's your first time here, please feel no pressure to give. But if you do call Woodlawn Church your home, there are ways that you can give. You can give in the boxes in the back. You can give online at woodlawnonline.com. You can give through our mobile app or just by simply scanning the code that's on the screen. But we'll pray and you'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. And Lord, may we walk this week keeping our thoughts captive and focusing on you and what you did for us.